from the Newswires. Powered by Kangaroo Fern Media Lab. It's odd. When the Optus data breach happened Thursday last week, it wasn't the biggest news event. Hackers Optus have published extremely confidential and compromising information. Australia's everyone's... largest health insurer is now this country's latest high-profile... Hi, I'm Mika Santos from redwires.au and welcome to the From the Newswires. For today's episode, we're talking about the steel, the Meadowbank saga. So today, another set of data was released in the dark web and um, our topic today is about that uh, Medibank data breach and also all different data breach that's happening in Australia right now. Our guest for today is Dr. Jeff Foster. So Dr. Foster holds a PhD in Cognitive Science from the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. His work focuses on behavior comp component of cybersecurity with emphasis on decision making and errors in judgment and decision making in a cybersecurity context. He also works within the broader behavior cybersecurity domain including usable human focus security and organizational security culture. Dr. Foster is the course director of Macquarie University of Cybersecurity Analyst in the Department of Security and Studies and Criminology. Welcome to the show, Dr. Jeffrey Foster. Yeah, thanks for having me, Nico. Okay. okay. So recently, so Medibanks recently announced before in October 13, they announced that they have a, a big a cyber attack. They suffer a cyber attack. So it's since October 13 right now, there's a new data was released today. How, did you have any idea what sort of data? Did yeah, you so today? what got released today or about midnight last night was uh, the full 6.4 gigabytes of data that uh, the ransomware company had held from Metabank. And uh, it'll be more of the same of what we saw in our previous leaks. So it's got a lot of data in there of uh, from AHM, all the student records for people who held medical insurance from AHM who were overseas international students, which leaked their names email addresses, phone numbers, uh, passport numbers, all that information. Same thing with customer accounts from Metabank, uh, along with uh, personal medical records. So do you think, uh, uh, Dr. Forster, is just going to be continue releasing this data to the dark web? And how, how, can we, how can we prevent that or what the government can do? Yeah, well, with the Metabank data, I mean, there won't be continued because this, this, uh, when they posted this up, they said case closed and they posted all the data. So as far as these hackers are concerned, they're done. Uh, but that's because it's all the data is now available. And uh, unfortunately, not a lot we can do in the case of the Metabank data. These are uh, the information is now out there. And while they didn't release bank account information or credit card details, they didn't uh, leak out passwords from what we can see so far which is all great but those are all the information you can change as well this so what's leaked here being dates of birth phone numbers addresses uh all, names all that information is the stuff that can't be changed unfortunately so there's not a lot we can do to protect yourself from the information that's been leaked out uh unfortunately that has leaked along with the medical records so there's no putting the cat back in the bag uh, so to speak what you can do is recognize that what people are going to use this information for what criminals are going to use it for and they're going to use it to try to extort people to uh, try to trick them into paying to keep their information secret they can't if you get any text messages or email saying pay us two thousand dollars and we'll take it off the dark web nobody can do that it's out there don't pay anybody the other thing they'll do is try to extort people based on their medical histories best thing you can do in those cases if you receive any emails or texts is to report it and ignore it so you can report that through uh, cyberreport.gov uh, in, in order to let the officials know that somebody's trying to blackmail you over that information but just ignore and do not respond let the hackers believe that it's a dead phone number or a dead email address and just don't reply to it they'll give up a lot quicker if you give any response they know they're talking to somebody and they're more likely to continue with it uh, otherwise, they'll use that to try to gain access to your accounts. They'll try to use your personal information to get access to your emails, to your bank accounts, that type of information, based on other details they can find about you on the internet. And to protect yourself on that, go through your main accounts, 
your bank accounts, your email accounts, your uni super, your superannuation accounts, all those details, and make sure you've got a unique, strong password associated with it, and that you've turned on two-factor authentication if you can, which is that when you try to log in and it sends you a text to enter a code, that's that's two-factor authentication. Because that way, even if they do manage to figure out your password or trick you into giving it to them, they still can't get in because they don't have access to your phone. So those are some of the several ways you can take to protect yourself. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Foster. So the government say just on November uh, November 12th, they launched like a, a task force on against this cyber criminal. Do you think this task force can do other things like to prevent this happening again? Uh, the task force could uh, make some inroads into small components of it. And, and I mean, not into this particular attack, obviously. The problem is, is that these larger criminal organizations operate largely in former Soviet Union states. Uh, and they do so because they, they operate with impunity. Uh, the government's there, in this case, a Russian hacking group. The government there will likely know exactly who they are and likely won't stop them because it benefits them for them to continue working. They don't do any hacks within Russia. They probably share information with the Russian government. And, and there's just not going to be any impunity. They won't be stopped in those cases. No matter what we do from from going after them kind of situation, we can figure out who they are, we can put in requests, but if they're large organizations that are working with their governments, there's nothing much that we can do to stop those. Another thing Claire O'Neill said she was going to do is to, to increase the size of the Australian Signal Directorate's offensive cyber attack group. That means is essentially that hacking back idea that they're going to actually try to not just thwart them from being able to complete their attacks, but in cases like these where they do attack, try to attack them back. Uh, is there certainly a precedent for that? Uh, the U.S. has done that for, for years. But there's also a danger to that. If these are uh, operating within foreign nation states such as Russia, how is the Russian government going to see that when we're attacking people within Russian boundaries? So there are some downsides to those kinds of hacking back that has been proposed. Not necessarily saying it's a bad idea, it's just that it's a bit more complicated than we're going to fight back. Yeah. So what's happened next now? So do you think uh, Australia, the act, the Australian government or any Australian companies are not expected that happen like this big one, a cyber attack, or we're not ready yet, or we don't we have, or we don't have, or being complacent about this cybersecurity. Yeah, well, I think we've been complacent for a long time. Unfortunately, we have some of the best cybersecurity professionals in the world, but industry has been. Uh, slow in actually putting the investment that they need in order to keep the data secure. And a big component of that has been a lack of, uh, of law and regulation that put in good punishments for companies not taking care of data. Uh, so, for instance, we've, we've now seen our previous one, when Optus was attacked, uh, was the law said a maximum penalty for improperly storing data or improperly securing personally identifying information had a maximum penalty of about $2.2 million. For a company like Optus, that is nothing. So there's not a lot of incentive to them in order to keep those data secure because the the cost, if they get if, if they get fined for it is 2.2 million, but for a company the size of Optus, the cost to actually keep that data secure is probably more than that per year that they have to invest extra. So there hasn't been a lot of incentive. Uh, there is current regulation going through, uh, was through the up through the lower house uh, about a month ago. I'm not sure if it's through the upper house yet. It's going to see a change in those regulations where the fines will suddenly become up to $50 million or 4% of adjusted GDP or GDP adjusted gross income for the company over the last year. So it's going to be a much larger fine. And that helps to take those boards and look at a cost benefit analysis and say, what is it going to cost us to actually secure these data better versus what's it going to cost if we get a fine? And it should make them uh, push them to do a bit better security within these organizations. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Foster. Just last question before we wrap up the, the mm. podcast. What going to be happening next? What do we expect? 
In terms of MetaBank or in terms of the industry? In terms of the in terms of uh, data breach in Australia. Yeah. So what's going to be happening next? Uh, well, I mean, with the MetaBank attack, we're gonna, we're going to start to see hackers start using it rather quickly if they haven't started already. So that should be one thing people are aware of. Once it's out there, uh, it becomes a, a timeline on how useful those data are. So your stolen data is, is really useful early on. By the time three or four people have tried to run a scam on you, it becomes less and less valuable. So people are going to start using those data against I mean, it's a third of the population that, that are in, encased in this breach. And people are going to start using it immediately to try to extort money out of people. So we've got to be really vigilant in the short term. We should be vigilant in the long term as well, but especially need it in the short term here. Uh, and so we should see that occurring rather soon. And there's nothing much that can be done to stop it, unfortunately. Uh, in terms of hacks in the future, I mean, these data breaches are going to occur for a while, I think. I think uh, Australia's criminal organizations have now seen the vulnerability in Australia and the uh, ability to make money off of these kinds of hacks because of uh, a generally poor security within some of these organizations or lots of vulnerabilities that don't get monitored. I think some of the regulations going through now... Uh, whether they uh, increased fine structures to organizations and uh, cyber offensive operations against these organizations, along with the possibility of banning some forms of ransom payments, will probably start to take its toll over time and reduce these number of attacks. But it's it's going to be a while before any of that actually has an effect. Thank you for that. So thank you, Dr. Jeffrey Foster, for your time. Oh, thanks for having me. Thank you so much. So there's another episode from the news wires from redwires.au. Thank you so much.